Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ravished, a historical romance and movie review podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Donna. Welcome to episode three of season two. Today, we're going to review the film The Best of Me based on Nicholas Sparks's novel of the same name. This review is kind of out of left field for me because it's not something I'd normally choose. I didn't really want to be a cliche and do a Nicholas Sparks movie or book because it always, you know, oozes romance and tragedy and sometimes can feel like a lifetime movie. You know what I mean? Oh, my goodness. I know. But I love the movies I've seen that are based on his books, like The Notebook, right? Yeah. Well, then what made you want to review this movie? I honestly had never watched this film before deciding to review it. Um, It was released 10 years ago, 2014. And I definitely remember seeing ads for it, you know, a decade ago. But (laughs) it didn't jump out at me. But recently I was perusing Netflix, as one does. And I saw it. I saw the main male character was played by James Marsden, who was introduced to me in the most famous Nicholas Sparks movie that you already mentioned, The Notebook. Do you remember the character he played? Um, oh, was he her fiance? Like the rich debonair fella who her mother so-called loved? Yes, he mm. was the other man who the female lead is about to marry but he loses the girl so sad for him (laughs) and seeing him in this other Nicholas Sparks movie I thought "Hmm, this might be his redemption role you know he lost the girl in the last film maybe this time he gets the happily ever after but unfortunately from watching the preview trailer on Netflix I really had zero clue of what the film was actually about it was you know pretty vague just kind of like hinted at a young love gone wrong and those lovers meeting again years later have you seen this film before I said we needed to review it no ma'am I mean I've always wanted to watch more of his movies but the one with Mandy Moore whatever it's called I couldn't get a walk to remember is that it yeah Okay. I mean, that that's pretty much where I stopped with my Sparks film gazing. Well, side note, fun fact, I went with our other two sisters to see A Walk to Remember and our cousin Ben. And did you really? Yeah. Every single person oh. was bawling their eyes out at the end. Oh my gosh. So long ago. Okay. So... Nicholas Sparks wrote the book, The Best of Me, in 2011, so it had to have been a hot read for it to have been made into a film just three years later, right? I yeah. mean, Out of Africa took like 50 years. 500. To make into- <laughs> yeah, closer to 500 years to make into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, season one, episode eight is Out of Africa. Nope. And that's a no. long time. No. Season I said two. to edit that in the freaking thing there. <laughs> season two, episode one. Ah, uh, yes. Season two, episode one out of Africa. And that's a long time for real. Did you rate that movie two out of five stars? I think you did. I don't remember, but maybe. Okay. I think it was okay. just such a, you know, classic. I didn't rate it that low, but it, I didn't get into it. I think you did. (laughs) Okay, so just to give you a synopsis of the film, since the previews were extremely vague, here's what the back cover of the book says. Everyone wanted to believe that endless love was possible. She'd believed in it once, too, back when she was 18. In the spring of 1984, high school students Amanda Collier and Dawson Cole fell deeply, irrevocably in love. Though they were from opposite sides of the tracks, their love for one another seemed to defy the realities of life in their small town in North Carolina. But as the summer of their senior year came to a close, unforeseen events would tear the young couple apart, setting them on radically divergent paths. Divergent? You said it right. It doesn't matter. Whichever one. Now, 
25 years later, Amanda and Dawson are summoned back home for the funeral of Tuck Haas Steltler, the mentor who once gave shelter to their high school romance. Neither has lived the life they imagined, and neither can forget the passionate first love that forever changed their lives. As Amanda and Dawson carry out the instructions Tuck left behind for them, they realize that everything they thought they knew about Tuck, about themselves, and about the dreams they held dear was not as it seemed. Forced to confront painful memories, the former lovers will discover undeniable truths about the choices they have made. And in the course of a single searing weekend, they will ask of the living and the dead, can love truly rewrite the past? That's it. How do you feel that description holds to the movie's version? I mean, that's such a Nicholas Sparks, you know, synopsis. I 100% feel his energy. (laughs) But also, it brings me back to the film and the parts that made me pretty frustrated. I think that it comes down to, you know, lack of communication and not realizing things aren't as unforgivable or as bad as they seem. You know, when you're a kid, once you grow up, things weren't as terrible as you thought they were in the moment. Um, But when you're young and you think high school is like the end all be all of your life and it's so extremely serious and intense, let me let you know, it's not. It's (laughs) not, folks. Not even a little bit. Um, You know, serious decisions are made when you don't fully understand what you're doing. So that was, ugh. Thanks, Nicholas. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... I am only really speaking for myself, but some other people probably too, that we were a bunch of idiots in high school. (laughs) Um, I definitely lighten up in ways and then toughen up in other ways if I could rewrite mine. Yeah, no, totally. Um, How do you feel about this storyline description? Would you pick this book up and want to read it or watch the movie? Um. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, nothing really grabs my attention, but I'd like to reread The Lady's Mind. (laughs) Yeah, of course you would. No. Um, Yeah, it just seems like a mushy, gushy movie (laughs) or book that it's like, okay, I need to cry. Um, But describing the characters in this film is a little different because we get to see the young versions and the adult versions of them. Unfortunately, I don't think they did the best job casting because let's be real, these younger versions look absolutely nothing, nothing like the adult versions, like not even a little bit, like even hair color, nothing. Uh, and Weird. I know, right? It just seemed like lazy or they were saying it wasn't important to try and make it seem more believable. I mean... Like, no similarities, and I just didn't get it. (laughs) So, sorry, casting director, but... Okay, (laughs) so we have James Marsden. He is the older Dawson. He is such a likable actor, loves so many movies he's in. Um, And I don't know a better word to describe his performance in this movie, but just, like, likable. Uh, He's so great at being this humble kid who started from nothing and became successful despite all odds. And he's pretty darn good looking and he just comes across so genuine. Yeah, he's a tall drink of water. He's a gym. I I agree with you. Um, Luke Bracey is the younger Dawson. And like I said, they look absolutely not a zero, nothing alike. And that was one of my least favorite things about the movie. Um, I didn't really love Luke Bracey as the younger Dawson either. I know, you know, as an adult, I'm very different from who I was in high school, but how he portrayed Dawson just seemed like a totally completely different person than who Marsden was playing as an adult version. Like they didn't seem like this, he would have grown into that person. So, yeah. Can I add that? I feel for me, it's important that the younger version of the character looks a little similar 
than the older version. I mean, <clears throat> I would feel like the same. I don't know what I'm saying. Connection. You know? Yeah, like it doesn't seem like you're watching the same people as a young version and an old. So it was just kind of like you had to get in your head. I don't know. Yeah, just kind of disappointing. Yeah. And, and noticeable. You notice it and you're yeah. like, wait, mm-hmm. come on. How hard was it to get a what? brunette? Come on. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So moving on to Amanda, the main female. Uh, character Michelle Monaghan plays adult Amanda. She's been in several popular movies like Gone Baby Gone, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. She has a very familiar face that like I feel like I've seen it in so many films, but this was the first time I saw her as a lead character and not just like a supporting actress. So she portrays Amanda as a somewhat bitter and guarded woman who went along with her life after Dawson left and just accepted or settled with a husband she resents because they got pregnant really fast and had two kids you know one of her children you find out passed away from childhood cancer which of course tore her marriage apart even further what what that wouldn't do it to anyone you know and then she has a son who does does what he wants all the time pretty reckless and to suffice to say she's just not really happy with her life when we yeah. see her as an adult. Okay. Liana Liberato was young Amanda. And again, I do not feel this actress looks like the adult version, even a little bit. I know it's, I keep repeating it, pet peeve, but it felt like it detracted from feeling like the movie could be real or like transporting me to their world. Cause it was just so opposite. Um, and Amanda portrayed by Liliana is portrayed as this bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, full of positivity and not jaded yet, like the adult version. So I could see Mm. how her character could have grown into the adult version, but it was just hard to connect them because again, no similarities. Um, Yeah. Strange. I know. I'm sorry. Um, Lastly, (laughs) the last character I want to tell you about is Tuck. He was played by Gerald McRaney. He is a de facto father for Dawson when he's younger, who helps him get away from his terrible, awful, horrible family. And he gives Dawson a chance for a better life. Amanda also grows close to him and he brings Dawson and Amanda back together after he passes away, which is how they reconnect. Um, or otherwise they never would have crossed paths. Um, I have a question. What does de facto father mean? So Dawson had a father, but he was an awful abusive person and like drug dealer who wanted Dawson to be part of this, you know, life of crime. And uh, so he ran away after being beat by his dad and uh, Tuck let him stay with him and protected him and didn't make him go back to his dad. So he like acted as if he was his father, even though he had one. Gotcha. Thank you. (laughs) So tell me about the plot that isn't told in the description I read above, please. Okay, so young Dawson is from our kind of family. (laughs) Just kidding. Kind of. A white trash, a white trash family who are. (laughs) Speak for yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Who are criminals. You know, they deal drugs, like I said. And that is not our family. (laughs) Liar. Trying to get some street cred. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so they're criminals. Well, this after I record it. <laughs> they're criminals. They deal drugs and they do all sorts of illegal things that Dawson, you know, he doesn't want to be a part of it. And he really resents his father and his brothers who are these awful, awful people. He tries to get away from their abuse pretty much lit like not pretty much the entire movie. He's trying to get away from them, even when he's an adult. Um, that's where he meets Tuck and finds a safe place 
to stay for the first time. Like I mentioned, his father and brothers are just so mad at him that he won't join them. So they beat the living daylights out of him. And then um, when they find out he's hiding at Tux, they actually destroy Tuck's property trying to like intimidate and get him to leave but Tuck like pulls his gun and is like get off my property um it's just like a huge mess full of hatefulness that Dawson is just trying to get away from so he can have a better life man what are families for huh (laughs) and I mean geez some people really like to hold others back like Mm -hmm. it's so frustrating to read about it and it undeniably happens way too often in Ex- real life too. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's pretty upsetting. And I, I feel like it may have been exaggerated in this, but you know, it might not have been because some people really do go through awful family life situations like this. So while we're learning the history of what brought together and tore apart Dawson and Amanda, like I said, we meet the adult versions and what brought them together after 25 years. Um, Tuck passed away and he gives his house and everything he has to Dawson and Amanda, along with some letters to each of them. Um, We find out about Amanda's unhappy life and Dawson's pretty empty life. You know, he just Mm -hmm. filled it with work and that's it. Um, his life is pretty much just he works on an oil rig in the middle of the ocean. And that's about it. That's all they tell you. So I feel like they could have went a little deeper into his life because there's yeah. no way you're 25 years later. That's all you've ever done. Um, But I think it was just pretty unrealistic. He had absolutely nothing going on in terms of relationships with anyone. You know, it made him seem pretty one dimensional and kind of fake because I don't know a man like that. (laughs) Yeah, unrelatable. And it's missing some important and worthwhile substance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a bit of a downer there, Amanda, dear. I mean, yawn on with Dawson and his uneventful life, including an unbelievable portrayal of him being single this entire time. Yeah. Hmm. So, well, what did you like least about this movie? Besides all the other things you already (laughs) stated. I was about to say, dang, did I even say something I like? Okay. Oh, what wait. else don't you like about this? <laughs> what I should say. So throughout the film, we learn, you know, about the tragedy, the defining moment that really tore them apart. And as adults, we see Dawson's family still trying to bring him down. And, uh, you know, Dawson and Amanda obviously discover each other once again, and it's just crazy. I want to share what it was, but, you know, I don't want to give spoilers out, but. Yeah. <sighs> don't do it. Ooh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't think I, it was the thing I disliked the most. I think this like the most should be the character um actors who were chosen for the characters but uh, it's just like frustrating I guess that what happened because you want to be like this is dope and fix it but you can't <laughs> yeah I mean geez let them live <laughs> I mean realistically we have one life yeah and we should have the freedom to live it as we wish mm-hmm. i it reminds me of uh the movie crybaby which we also reviewed reviewed yeah. and did an episode on i'm gonna say season one episode nope. four don't even say it we don't know what episode but it was season one <laughs> one of the awesome episodes we've done um <laughs> but the guy who played hatchet face's boyfriend yeah he there at Turkey Point and his parents were there with their wooden crosses and their Bibles <laughs> and everything. And they're, you know, trying to convert all the the drape teenagers mm-hmm. into good Christian children. And uh he was like, he was like, geez, mom and dad, I'm a teenager. I want to live. <laughs> Ooh, I'll never forget that. I love that movie. I do. Check too. out the episode, y'all. 
It's a classic. It is. It's <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to say one more thing about it. It's in the genre of camp. Mm-hmm. Our favorite, John Hughes. Right? Yeah. Was yeah, I think Hughes? so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Am I crazy? Yeah, Are good memory. Sure? Yep. I'm going to look it up. But so who would you recommend this movie to, Donna? It was not John Hughes. Oh. It was John Walter. So I was almost there. That's John what Hughes I meant. is like the Breakfast Club. And- Oh, he <clears throat> he. Moving on. Any um, use? I think as a woman, is representing all women. <laughs> we sometimes have moments where we want a good cry and a sappy romance. You know, like I don't know, The Notebook. Um, and if you need that cathartic release, this movie is a good contender. And if you need a good cry and you just want to see uh, the hottie mchottie james marsden watch this movie <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not going to win any academy awards but i think it's good for what it is which all nicholas sparks movies are kind of or books and storylines follow generally the same you know tragedy love again tragedy that i've that i've noticed <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I understand that. But in my personal experience, I always fast forward the sad parts, <laughs> even books, movies, it doesn't matter. I mean, I want to escape into a land of love and passion for life, you know, and struggles are necessary to learn and grow and strength from but I'm just not interested in staying down and that involve involves like reading books or watching movies that bring my spirits down and anyway um no thanks uh and what do you rate this movie out of five stars drum roll please um so imdb imbd rates this film 3.5 stars out of five and 6.6 out of 10 so just over average um but I'm going to give it two out of five stars. It's okay. It didn't move me or have like anything deeper. It just, mm, it was okay. Do you think you would watch it, Nick? Nope. But I want you to know that I appreciate your review and you did great. Thank you, dear. Well, everyone, this wraps up our review of The Best of Me. Thank you for joining us this week. Yes. I mean, it's been great recording again. I hope we get to do this more often. You know, having a hobby that's not centered around my kids is so incredible. (laughs) Yes. We'll be back in roughly two weeks for another episode. Please remember to rate, write a review, and subscribe to Ravish on your favorite podcast platform. Also, follow us on Instagram and Threads at Ravish Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We promise we'll try and have another episode in only two weeks. (laughs) Bye. Bye.